So um, let me introduce you to some of my friends that are here with me this afternoon. All the way from Bangladesh, we have Nathan Biswas, and we are so glad that you have joined us. Next to Nathan, we have Donna Wilson, all the way from um, Ontario, Canada. So we are glad that she has come to join us. She's a pastor there, and Nathan is head of all of our work in Bangladesh. Next to me, we have Chris Zimmerman, all the way from Germany. He's a Nazarene church planter in Germany, and we're glad that you have joined us. And then we have Jeff Barker, who is a professor at Eastern Nazarene College and also a Nazarene pastor in the Boston area. So thanks to this whole group for being here, and we're just gonna kind of sit around this table here and kind of have a conversation. Um, I'd like us to get to know one another a little bit better, and I'm gonna start over here with Nathan. Um, Nathan, would you share with our group here um, a little bit about your work and your ministry and what's going on in Bangladesh, and maybe bring into that a little bit about church membership and how that's going in Bangladesh for you? Uh, thank you, Carla, for inviting me to be here. Uh, I'm. Uh Happy to be here and a great time. The Bangladesh is a country called third world country and it's a highly uh, Islamic audience. 87% uh, is a uh, Muslim people and nowadays uh, they are very much um, uh, active on the OIC means Islamic uh, organization of the countries. Uh, so the Christianity is uh, harder and harder and harder every day so, and the gospel is not uh, welcome uh, in country of Bangladesh. So compassion ministry is really the gateway uh, to the gospel in the country 20 years back. And as a church, um, uh, Church of the Nazarene and the uh, holiness tradition, uh, 20 years, uh, uh, I'm the first Nazarene in country in Bangladesh, um, 1993, April the 1st. And last month, the, the uh, country uh, meet with the Protestant denomination together, evangelicals and uh, ecumenicals. And they uh, discovered and they declared the Nazarene is number one denomination. But not only the number, but also the practice and the quality. So it means that uh, we as a church, we are not encouraged uh, people to join with us uh, or transferring membership, I mean the other, other um, uh, Christians, but we are focusing to uh, fresh uh, Nazarene from the other faith, uh, like uh, Hindus, uh, uh, traditional uh, uh, indigenous people and the Muslim. Uh, so we, uh, uh, we, we are really blessed and you will be surprised that we have now 104,000 a Nazarene member in Bangladesh within 20 years. So 20 years, 20 years. and you've gone from one to, to 104,000 members in yes. Bangladesh. And when I'm here sitting here, and definitely uh, 1.8 to 2.5 uh, churches established every day. Uh, so that's a really, uh, though it's a harder, but God is good. And uh, we are happy about that. And the uh, churches are growing. Now we have uh, 2,500 plus uh, churches in the country of Bangladesh. Wow. So, and uh, our goal or our passion is uh, uh, Bangladesh, uh, the geographical setup is like uh, 68,000 villas all over the country and 160 million people, um, 55,000 square miles, very small country geographically. But population, I think we're the second highest densely populated country. And our crazy goal in our lifetime, we want to see every village should have one Nazarene church. And we, we need to be a long way to go. That's, uh, that's about Bangladesh. Wow, what a great story. Now let's just kind of maybe contrast that a minute with what's happening in the United States. And let's go to... Uh to you, Jeff, and why don't you talk to us a little bit about your context and what you feel like is happening where you are. Well, certainly my context is markedly different <laughs> in the sense that uh, we're seeing fewer and fewer people committed to an institution over a long period of time. Uh, so even one practice that I think we've had in the Church of the Nazarene over time was that if a parishioner was moving from your church, you would alert the, the pastor of the, the next town where they were going to be living that this family is coming and will be looking for 
a church and particularly a Nazarene church. Uh, that's not the case. And so how that plays out in terms of membership is that we will take in members who will be uh, participants in our congregation's life for a number of years. They will move and there's no then follow up of transfer of membership. Uh, so that then r raises these questions of how do you even maintain an active membership? Uh, they'll fall off the radar screen. You don't necessarily know where they are. And at the same time, we are taking in members, but it's a different kind of member, right? A, a member with lower levels of commitment and engagement. Uh, what does that actually mean in the life of a congregation? So those are some of the struggles, certainly a, a marked contrast from what we've just heard in Bangladesh. Uh, and at the same time, wrestling with what are the implications for membership, right? Uh, and as we have a, a growing population of, of young Christians who are deeply committed to particular issues of justice, responsibility, uh, they wrestle with some of our membership requirements and what that actually looks like. And so there are lower levels of, of membership. So I'm facing the dilemma of a congregation that has fewer people becoming members, which has implications in for leadership, who can be on the church board? What does that actually look like? And so facing some of those challenges, not that they're standing in contrast to who we are as a church. They understand, they embrace it, but they just don't have that sense of long-term commitment and identity with an institution in that kind of way. You know, I think what becomes obvious is sitting around this table, the contexts in which we're doing ministry are so varied, and yet we are all part of the Church of the Nazarene. And how does the global Church of the Nazarene look at these kind of issues and help us to understand that we're all in different situations? Donna, how about telling us a little bit about uh, where you are and your context and your ministry and uh, share with us a little bit. Okay. Thank you, Carla. I serve in Canada and I'm an ordained pastor on Canada Central District and I've served a small church, Erie Street Community Church since 2005 for eight years. And it was a restart. When I went there, there was an afternoon service being held, and there was about 10 people, all members, with very low to nil capacity for local outreach. Um, so right from the beginning, I felt that part of my work was to help them learn to engage in the community around them. Um, but it's a very difficult task with 10 members that are not used to doing that. Um, we had to create a new normal to even think about bringing people into the church, let alone bringing members in. And so that happened over eight years. It's taken a long time. But we've created a new normal where people come into a community of faith and... and uh, gradually, you know, think about membership. Um, what I find is people don't become members for the reason that the church has membership. The church has membership for accountability and responsibility. Um, I find the people that do become members are already a part of an authentic community of faith. And they they become members because they're a part of that loving and caring community. So that's what we try to focus on and build. We know that as a church and as leaders, we need the other. We need accountability and responsibility. But I don't think any of our new people have become members for that reason. Very interesting. And Chris, you're a church planter in Germany. I'd love to hear about what you're doing and also some of your thoughts on church membership in your context. Yes, thanks that uh, I can participate in this discussion and thanks for the invitation. We started about uh, three years ago with a new church plant downtown Frankfurt. Uh, I'm a third generation Nazarene and um, been raised in the church. Uh, but about three and a half years ago, I felt a strong call to actually move out of our traditional familiar church context and, and take a group of about 10 people right downtown Frankfurt, and of all places, we start to uh, minister in a pub, a pub right downtown Frankfurt, and we decided we want to, as a group, want to be church for them. And you can imagine that that is an interesting thought uh, in our church, uh, but that's what we've started to do. 
um, we moved into that place and found a place where community is already happening, where relationships are already happening, and we just wanted to come in and, and be part of that and start working and ministering with these people. Obviously, we could not come in with our rules and regulations and our thoughts and impose them on these people. Uh, we would have been kicked out immediately. Um, and, and that's kind of the, uh, the idea um, that has led to many different uh, uh, points that we have in Frankfurt where we now minister without taking in official members. So now within uh, this past three years we've grown uh, to do ministry in an elderly's home. Uh, we created a coffee shop. Uh, we have a hospital where we do services. We uh, have an event at a movie theater. So we created all these different events where we moved into neighborhoods, where we moved into subcultures, uh, not to superimpose our rules and regulations, but to work and minister and live with people and through that transform them. Sounds very interesting. Now, my mind is full of questions actually for every one of you, but I'm going to let it go the other way. And if you guys have questions for one another, maybe. Do you have any questions for, for any of them? Uh, uh, I heard about Chris that you started a church in a coffee house. So this is very new concept. And uh, can you tell us about something, uh, how the Nazarene can uh, uh, tradition, I mean the outside the tradition, how can you scope, scoping that as a, you know, if you give the membership, you need to certain uh, level. So how the concept uh, came into your mind to be a church in a coffee house in a Frankfurt downtown? Yeah. Well, the basic uh, problem that we are facing in Germany is that uh, people are not coming to the church anymore. Um, that is partly true for our Nazarene church, but as well for many other denominations. Uh, we don't really experience any church growth, new members as a denomination or as denominations. So it only takes so, and so long till people decide if people are not coming to us, we need to go to them and start working with them. And that means leaving our home territory, a church building, and moving out into a neighborhood, into a subculture, and start working with them. And you can either, you, you basically have two, two ways on how to do that. Either you move into a, a third place, or you create one. With the coffee shop, we created one. So it's a coffee shop right downtown Frankfurt, opposite of the University of Applied Science. It's on, uh, at the bottom of a, a skyscraper. So we're the coffee shop for that building, as well as for the students from the university. And we just started to serve coffee. Uh, we've got about 15 employees who work there six days a week. We open at seven o'clock in the morning till seven at night. And all we specialized in on the first place was to serve the best coffee in town. But in our context, a coffee shop is a place of relationship. People come there regularly, a few times per week. We even have customers who come there three times a day. So it, it's only natural to build a relationship with, the, with your customers and start relating to them. We don't have a church sign uh, on, on top of the coffee shop. We don't have any Bibles lying around. We're just doing a coffee shop. But we're doing it as Christians. We're doing it as, as the people of God on the mission of God. And through that, we are building relationships and inviting people to experience and live the kind of things that, that we're passionate about. Have you moved into having church at all at the coffee shop? Yes, well, well we have a, well, depends on what you mean by uh, church. Yeah. A worship service? A worship do? service. Okay. We, on, on Sundays, we actually do have a worship service. It's a brunch service at one o'clock. But then we very specifically announce it as a worship service. So outside, we, we put a little sign and say, now is a worship service inside, so that we don't surprise anyone. We don't want people to be sitting, uh, zipping on their coffee, and all of a sudden be surprised by, who's preaching or, or teaching or what are we singing now. So then we make it very explicit. Um, and we invite people into that, but only as we build a relationship. So no advertisement during the week with flyers or any kind of uh, other advertisements. 
but you were telling me about how many people are now a part of your ministry. You don't have any members, do you? No, we don't have any members. <laughs> okay. um, well, we, just this last Sunday, we had uh, three different services. At 10 o'clock in the morning, we do a service at an elderly's home, where about three months ago, we decided to go into this elderly home and in the dining hall of that place, set up a worship service. It's a place of 110 people who live there, and only 10 of them can still leave the building. So they could not go to any other worship service on Sunday morning. So we basically, as a church community, decided to go in there and just set up a little church service. So we had about 45 people in that service. Then at 1 o'clock we do the service at the coffee shop. We have about 80 people that attend that, and that's maximum. We, we can't really fit more people into that room. We have some people standing. In the evenings we have a service at a hospital. And what we do is, it's one of the biggest hospitals in Frankfurt, we go throughout the whole hospital uh, two hours prior to the service and just invite people to a, a chapel concert service. And uh, we have patients from that hospital, on about 25 to 35 people, who just then come to that chapel service. Now, in terms of membership, how would I take members in a hospital, how would I take members uh, at an elderly's home? It, it would be very difficult with, with our model. And, and that would be my case, membership, no membership. I think it highly depends on the kind of model ministry that you're doing. So I would never say to Nathan, you shouldn't have members. But in our context, it, it, it just would not work to, to establish that. Very interesting. Um, I'm, I'm just curious, Nathan, when people are coming out of the other faiths and becoming Christians in Bangladesh, what does church membership mean to them? And I mean, is that actually, is it a positive thing there to become members? You hear him talking in Europe, that might be a difficult thing. What's it like in your culture? Yeah, good question. That's, uh, I can give you the example. What does this mean, be a member? Uh, we set up a small church in a rural extremely rural, still do not have the electricity, that village. So one day I'm visiting that it's a very little church, about 30 people, and uh, Bamboo Thaddeus house, traditional homes, and the church meeting there every Sunday. And it's only for one hour or two hours, but rest of the week we use as a child ministry center, we call child development center. So on morning I'm visiting one of the children home, the young lady come to me on the, on the field and I have to cross. There is no decent road, so I took off my shoes and walking on the field, ground. So the young lady came to me, hey, why are you are taking care of my children? Very young lady, I'm, I'm shocked. I said, Lord, help me. Then, then I said, you know what? The Jesus loves me, so that's why I love your children. So then she asking me the second question, who is this Jesus? So then I invite he, her to meet with my pastor, the local pastor. So then this pastor is introducing Christ to her. That's her two kids attending the CDC, Child Development Center, through this center. So she know the Christ who is the Jesus. And now mentoring her and her family Sooner or later, this young couple became a Christian, not only the Christian, good Nazarene. Then we discipled them two years in a course called South Asian Nazarene Bible College. Now both of them, husband and wife, both of them committed to be a pastor and last year they are ordained. So you see that is not only a piece of paper uh, writing their name or regular practice in the church, no. See, when, when they are, and they are fire to let Christ known to other relatives, maybe 200 miles from their village, their relatives, they are fired to go them and tell them that we are changed. How we are changed? Spiritually. So then, this family is, you know, the other village, other relatives. So that's the secret growth of the Church of the Nazarene in, in Bangladesh. So I don't know whether it's uh, me answer your question or not. 
Well, you know, one thing that I'm hearing, though, is you're using the child development centers yeah. as a way for children to come in and get training. Mm -hmm. And I'm listening to Donna saying, we need to create community. I'm listening to you saying, we need to go into their community. There's something relational about all of this. And also doing some non-traditional kind of church work. I'm just curious, Donna, if you could tell us a little bit. You talked about how you had to kind of change that environment. What kind of things have you done? And then how have you taken in new members? First of all, I would just like to say it's a privilege to sit beside Nathan. Uh, Canada has been a partner to a lot of his work through Canadian Food Grains Bank, and over, we, it's just such a privilege to share in ministry that we can't go and do what he's doing. Um, to create community, it's been twofold. I have partnered with uh, other pastors in the area we live in a very secular uh, context. I'd say less than 3% attend church on a Sunday morning. So we are the extreme minority if we're in church. And the people outside of the church had no idea what we're doing in the church. <laughs> and we came to that stark realization about seven years ago. And so several of us, different denominations, began to work together. And so building the community has actually happened from the outside in. We uh, also reached out to the community together with different outreach efforts, um, offering special programs at Christmas, um, caring for the poor, um, advocating for people um, for, with matters of justice. And those people in turn came into the church because they knew they were being cared for. And that helped develop community in the church. Um, we're in a society where people really shy away from membership of anything. In Canada, people don't even become members of a political party. They, I think that's a little different than the USA. They align themselves with a leader, whether it's provincial or, um, or you know, our prime minister national. Um, so they're not used to be members of anything. And so I think membership in the church, it's so greatly needed, but it, it's so opposite to what people are thinking. Um, but as we draw them into authentic community and as we care for the people, um, we've also um, are helping open up a cafe in town. So we're going a very similar direction to what you've done, um, just to have a meeting place for people to have spiritual conversations. And we have a soup day once a week in our building that's helped our long-term members realize the benefits of just having conversations with people um, to get to know them and draw them to Christ. I'm gonna throw this over to Jeff a minute. Um, as a pastor in the United States, what are you doing for church membership? How do, you, how do you deal with the question? And what practically then do you do if you are taking in members? <laughs> It's a fascinating question. What are we actually doing with membership? Uh, so certainly there, there are tiers here of understanding, right? So I'll have uh, generations of Nazarenes, second, third, fourth generation, who understand what membership is and still embrace that in some kind of way. Even though they're, they're younger, it's, it has as much to do with their identity as it does with uh, the, the whole notion of membership, right? No, this is my family tradition. We are Nazarenes. This is how I have come to understand my faith. This is the church that has shaped me and formed me. And so I maintain that identity. But then we have the whole context of general evangelicalism. And so there's this hyphenated identity. We don't really know who we are. And so we have to spend a lot of time working through what does it mean to be Nazarene? What is a doctrine of holiness? What does this actually look like? What does accountability mean? And that's where I think we get more and more of the resistance is this, this notion of accountability that people read as an invasion into their lives. Uh, so I think there's this privatization that has happened, at least in our context, where we have private property, we own all of these things, that shapes the way then we even think about what does it mean to share in community. So community, even though we want to talk about it in rich, deep ways, is really a peripheral kind of way of interacting with one another. Because when you start to push the notion of community, of really sharing life and opening up your life to accountability, there's some resistance to that. So we, so we have 
groups that will come in and say, yes, I'm Nazarene, and so I want to be a part, and I want to identify in this kind of way. And there are others who are saying, well, I like what you all are about, but I'm not sure I want to fully identify with you. I'm going to come every week. I'm going to participate in these ministries, uh, but I'm not sure. And then I have some who see membership as a means of taking on responsibility, and so they actively choose not to be members because they're afraid they'll have to serve in some kind of way. Right? So that, that, that just becomes a very truncated way of understanding what, what membership ultimately is about. And so, Don, I've appreciated your language of accountability and responsibility and starting to talk about it in that kind of way. It's not so much an evasion as it is a mutual opening of our lives that says we're in this thing together, and it's more than just following a list of rules and regulations of how we live, but it creates a grid for us to share life so we can figure out how to wrestle through disagreement or conflict, and that it does provide accountability for how we, how we live, right? Am I taking care of my body? Am I caring for my neighbor? So those are some of the things in membership that I don't think we've historically talked about, at least in the U.S. We've talked more about behavior and some things. But really, some of the the general ideas that are embedded in our membership have actually to do with, are you loving your neighbor? Are you taking care of your family? Are you stewarding your life well? Are you being faithful to God? And I think a lot of that may have gotten lost over a period of time. And so we're trying to retrieve that framework of thinking about what membership is. It's actually identifying yourself as a part of a community, opening yourself up then to accountability, and not just to judge one another, but to mutually support one another to help discern good and right and faithful decisions. So we have obviously a cross-section of a lot of different things going on, but trying to to elevate the notion of membership beyond just, oh, we want your tithe here, but actually, no, you need to belong here. So that be, that's even more difficult with a lot of transient people. So being close to the college will have people move for a short period of time and then move on. And so that challenges us regarding membership as well. Well, I'd just like to get your opinion on something. Um, something that I ran into as we pastored here in the States was a lot of people that would come to the church and after a certain period of time believed they were part of the fellowship and thought they were members. Um, there, there was a sense of ownership, and I'm just even wondering, like in your coffee shop ministry, you know, does it come to that place? And then if people feel that kind of ownership without officially going through a class, you know, how do we deal with that? I know that some of the larger churches that now when we call new pastors will send out two ballots of different colors. Official members vote on one color ballot and non-members who think they're members vote on another ballot just to get an idea of the cross-section of those that are actually there. So I think we're coming up with all these. And, and so what do you do with those that um, already think they're members but they've never been through a membership club and don't really want to go through the membership class? Or, or I don't know. I mean, it's just... Or at some point, do you just decide that this 100 people are really Nazarenes? I don't know. I'm just curious. What do you think? Well, I think it's awesome if people feel they're part of the ministry. And why would I push them to sign a paper? Well, before we start with our ministry, um, I, I read a description uh, that basically outlined there are two ways on how to, to, as a shepherd, take care of your flock. One way is to build a fence, open the gates, and invite, as a shepherd, the sheep into the fence. And that's probably our traditional way of membership. We define very clearly what are the corners, what are the boundaries of those who are in and those who are out. Now that's one way to take care of the sheep and if it works I'm fully for it and we uh, and do it. Um, now there's another way to to take care of your sheep which is to to dig a well. And it's very natural for sheep to eat and drink. So there will be some who are closer to the well and to come more often to drink because they feel like they have a spiritual thirst, so they'll be there every week. Others will only come once a month. Some may only come once a year. But your job as a shepherd is to keep that well fresh and alive 
or uh, spiritually speaking, Christ-centered, that the core is, 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 is Christ. And then people will be drawn to that. So I don't need to be in the business of building fences and painting the fences and a, a, a gatekeeper opening and closing that gate and then uh, feeling it a bummer when they don't show up uh, on time at the gate. But I can just be responsible to keep the center of the ministry fresh and alive, Christ-centered. And people will be drawn to that. Because if we actually believe that we all have a spiritual thirst and a spiritual hunger, then it is natural to come and to eat and to drink. Well, and I think that raises an interesting question in terms of our polity and legality, right? And so, in some ways, our, our history tells us that we're kind of formed in a very democratic way of understanding how we make decisions and how those decisions are legalized. And so, that, I think that's the underlying question in the notion of membership, right? because it has legal implications for us. Certainly, we have people who identify us as their church. Right? They'll show up once, twice, a decade. Right? We just had someone contact us from the neighborhood to do a funeral for a son who OD'd, but they understood us to be their church. They, that's where they belong. Are they members? No, they're not members, and they're then, I guess, trying to at least recognize the one level of belonging and community that's deeply important that people feel and embrace, and yet there's this underlying issue of polity that's critical in our decision making, in our incorporated status, and so many different pieces that I think is troubling for most people to even understand why we have to function in this kind of way. On a layer in my context, very strong Roman Catholic, and so baptism and confirmation is a way of belonging, right? So they're not taking in members in the same kind of way we take in members because their polity is very different than ours. And so those who come to our congregation just assume they've been baptized, they're confirmed, they're participating, they're members. That's how it's always been done before. So there's education then that has to happen in some kind of way. But I do want to at least highlight the, the polity piece and the legal piece as part of the decision making in our context. In the recent publication, Our Church, Your Home, it encourages the church to be living and loving in community and that membership shows people's commitment to do that. I think there's a, a time when we have to encourage people to commit more. And we have an example in Ontario in a non-committal society where there's, it's a non-Nazarene but spirit-filled church where the pastor has raised the bar very high for membership and it's gone from a church plant to a mega church in 10 years. And if people are taking a membership class and they miss a class, they're, they're not in the membership system anymore. So sometimes I wonder if we do settle for less, thinking it will help our church when it doesn't. So I, I'm like you as well, Chris, I'm trying to find that balance of keeping the doors open wide because we're called to do that, but at the same time, bringing people to a place where they can sign the covenant of Christian character. And it, it is a hard balance. I think uh, uh, another area that, as he mentioned, that the, uh, the practice of the democracy in the church. So the people, uh, the member can uh, uh, feel comfort that it's not one man or some of the family. Sometimes the church act like a family enterprise business. But uh, once uh, they see that uh, uh, the Nazarene are practicing total democracy system or the total democracy. And the other area in Bangladesh that we try to create a uh, uh, child-friendly church and uh, parents are uh, very much uh, feel comfort to send uh, their children uh, that uh, when they send the children it means sooner or later you are going to get the parents also so that's uh, that's the that's a, one of the area we practicing that child-friendly uh, child-friendly church it's mean that not ignoring the children or ignoring the poor. So that some city church, they say, oh, 
uh, uh, who said that um, uh, the, the rich people will sit in the front, the poor people sit in the back. So the Nazrin we are practice uh, equal values, you know. Yeah. So rich or poor, who is giving much, who is giving low, low in the church, it does not make any sense. But everybody has a eyes of the God, men and women, and the rich and poor is an equal treat. So that's also uh, give us some more space, uh, be a comfort in the, in the church. That's, that's I want to mention. You know, I think what I'm hearing you're saying, and I'm, I'm thinking about some of these others, is you know, I'm thinking about this well that you're digging. That's kind of this center, this core. And it's this core of preaching. It's this core of equality of humanity together when we worship. It's what, what we sense in the ethos of who we are um, that becomes important to people identifying with who we are. I think in light of that, what's interesting is that we can help people, if I can say this, understand that we are Wesleyan Arminian. We are Nazarenes by how we act, by what we preach, by what we feed them. And we might be surprised at how much even non-members, if they might consider themselves non-members, might really understand who we are as Nazarenes. So I don't know if part of what I'm getting even from this conversation is that we need to be true about who we are as leaders. Our identity has to be clear. We have to be clear about what we're preaching. And then, and then really we are bringing people in a sense into membership because they are around our well. Sure. Because your well is not going to be the same as the Baptist well down the street. Yeah. I think that's kind of cool because that's what I think, even though our contexts are all so different, to me, that's a little bit about what we're all saying is the same. Yeah. And I want to follow up with, with Donna. I, I think we've used a similar phrase. I've talked about lowering the bar. <laughs> this question of is in our context, which I think ours is probably fairly similar, is growing the church or are somehow quantifying what we're doing, has that contributed to us lowering our expectations, right? So that we can, can some kind of re give some kind of report that we're actually doing something meaningful uh, because digging a well, uh, how do you tell if that's meaningful or not? Only over time. So I'm beginning to, to try to retrieve Wesley's notion of classes and accountability and some things that way as a way of thinking about not just belonging to this congregation and participating when it's convenient, but then sharing life and opening our lives in deeper ways that really is, I think, the, the impulse of what membership was originally about. It wasn't so much a list of checks and balances as we, we're doing all of these, but it, it's this is who we are, this is what it means to be Nazarene. We care about people, we love people, there's equality around the table, that this is who God has called us to be, and in our gathering together, we bear witness to this, and it requires us to actually raise the expectations then on how we interact with one another. So I, I think I resonate with your phrase, the, the, the fear of lowering the bar too low has left us with this malaise of Settling anything. For less. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we have a great message, and I know it, all of us believe in membership. Um, but we're just coming at it from different angles. But we have the message, you know, in the Church of the Nazarene, along with many other wonderful denominations of the saving work of Jesus Christ and the cleansing work of the Holy Spirit. And if membership not only facilitates the work of the church, but encourages people to take their faith more seriously and to be in a living and loving community of faith, then... We, we need to lead them towards it. Sure. Yeah, one, th oh, go ahead. Well, but we also have to say, if it's preventing us to do our mission, then we shouldn't be doing it. Because th that's where I, I, I've just seen and talked to many frustrated church leaders who feel like we, we've, we've raised the bar, and we, we, we've, we've built a fence and somehow we're not getting the people in it, it, it's not working we're not seeing the results we're not seeing numbers we're not seeing conversions so if it's preventing us uh, that's because we said we all believe in membership no i don't believe in membership in that sense i, I believe in a mission and, and our nazarene mission making christ-like disciples of all nations and by whichever form uh, and and it does not need to be enrolling people 
uh, what I wanted to say to you, Nathan, uh, the de democratic system that we've created, um, I, I, I think there's, there's, there's again, I c it can be very positive. In your context, giving the poor and the rich the same vote is awesome. The problem that I see in my context is, as soon as we establish a, a church and get a representative model where the congregation elects their representatives to the church board, then what the church board by design does, it, it represents the congregation. And what happens then, or what can happen, is that we forget the outsiders because the church board is representing those who are already inside. So my question is, who's representing the outside inside? Then it's up to the pastor to be really passionate and really on fire for the outsiders, for the lost, to bring them in. But the church board says, well, but have you thought about our Sunday school and have you thought about our youth ministry and we need to take care of our children and our teenagers, which is all good, but we can lose our mission over that. And that's where I say front and center should be the mission and not the membership. Uh, uh, to me, you know, uh, that's uh, for sure that we are not going to compromise our mission at We Are Missional Church. Those who are interested or who are embers uh, our mission or our uh, uh, theology or, uh, you know, our faith, our values, uh, and uh, they are going to practice in the church. Not only the church, but in the family, in a working place, or in a marketplace. So, but I agree with you that we are not really going to make a fence uh, to protect that don't come. Uh, or uh, sometimes we feel that if people came, uh, I'm in a danger, or I may lose my position. I may lose my, um, what I say, that's, you know, sometimes we really don't want people to come. But uh, it always is danger is there. But we want to take the risks, you know, uh, to, to provide uh, people uh, a space to come and see and testify. Uh, so if, uh, uh, if we really a good Nazarene practice our faith, uh, our uh, mission statement or our mission, our missional, you know, I won't see, yes, people are there. 20 years I am in experience in my church. I see that some people came, so they, they came with purpose. So they came to be a member and with their uh, previous experience, previous attitude. So when they became a member and do not get that kind of facilities or, you know, then they backslide. You know, I see many, many of them, they came and they could not, could not uh, continue longer period of time. So, but both, both way I can see, but at least I want to be very open and give them the opportunity. Here is the opportunity, but uh, if, you, if you want to join, you can take that opportunity. So, I don't want to uh, reject or I don't want to be cautious. Yes, yeah, sometimes I'm cautious that who, who I'm going to uh, take as a member. So, um, We have some members who are not very committed to the mission. And I think that's why this issue is being raised. And then we have some non-members that have brought in half of our church. So we <laughs> face this all of the time. What I'm suggesting is I do believe in the mission of the Church of the Nazarene. And we can raise the bar higher so that a person, as Nathan said, is not coming into membership until they are in line with the mission which is going out and caring for the poor and caring for social needs while we share the message of Christ. Well, and so I think one thing that I'm hearing about membership, and this is globally as well, is it has to be discipleship. And if we make membership about a fence, then we're focusing on the wrong thing. But if membership were about drawing them closer to the well, if yeah. membership were about helping them to, to go deeper spiritually, then I think that there'd be great appeal to that. And in some ways, that would be raising the bar. Because I think in some ways we've tried to make, make it easier to get more people in. But I think people are hungry for fresher, deeper water. 